All right. Welcome, everyone, to Value Investing Live. I am pleased to welcome our guest today, Patrick Brennan, the founder and portfolio manager of Brennan Asset Management. Prior to starting his own firm, he worked at Mark Boyer and Company and led the firm's research team and helped manage $800 million in assets across individual portfolios, institutional accounts, and a mutual fund. He is also a chartered financial analyst and has given numerous presentations at value investing conferences. As always, to those of you out in the audience, do please feel free to post your questions and comments in the chat throughout the presentation, but keep in mind we do hold those until we get to the Q&A at the end of things. Without anything further from me, I'll go ahead and hand things over to Patrick and we can jump into the presentation today. Great. Thanks a lot, Graham. Thanks a lot to uh, Guru Focus for giving me the opportunity to present. Here are your typical disclosures, uh, you know, read them through as you, as you go through the presentation, you know, investment advice, et cetera, et cetera. So take a close read of those. All right. So, uh, you know, here we begin. I, I, I'm going to go through and talk just a little briefly about myself and my background. And I, I probably have ha always found it's more helpful to talk on individual ideas as, as, and in terms of how someone approaches value investing um, and investing in general. Um, so um, this is me. I, I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, so I, I like to think the value investing roots run fairly deep. Um, I went to Notre Dame for undergrad, and then for six years, uh, I did uh, investment banking and sell-side research. And I focused uh, first on the financial service uh, industry, uh, doing capital raising and M&A for banks. And then I spent a lot of time in media telecom. And then at the end of my time, I was in... Um, uh, a bit of consumer discretionary and actually briefly covered retail on the on the sell side. Um, so I, I bring that up is because those you know industries that I, I probably had initial experience in are probably the ones I, I still focus in on the the most today. Um, uh, I I moved over the buy side in uh, 2004, and as Graham mentioned, I, I, I led the research team for Boyer Asset Management. Um, I came out to California in uh, 2009, and I worked for two firms, RBO and Company and Hutchinson Capital Management. And both, all three, from uh, my time on the buy side, it was uh, it was a generalist focus. It was it was fairly concentrated value investing. It's probably 20 positions, you know, five percent each. Um, and you know, you, you covered a lot of uh, sectors. As I said, I tend to when I open my own firm. Um, I focus in on sort of, you know, really three industries in particular. I used to, you know, love the idea of uh, being able to look at everything traveling the world, and I hated being restricted as an analyst. And then, yeah, you know, as time went on, I found I really had more value to add uh, when, you know, focused in areas that I know best. Um, I look for, you know, in terms of outside of the industries, I, I, I spent a lot of time on owner operators. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, Liberty Media Complex, one of the kind of great examples of owner operators uh, in general. I, I've just sort of found the incentives are aligned. Um, it's a lot easier for me to get comfortable with a name, um, especially ones that I'm going to own in size. Um, within the financial uh, service space. I, it was usually special situations. These weren't money center banks. I was opening, uh, you know, owning. I did a lot with, uh, you know, uh, thrift and um, thrift conversions, uh, preferred stock. You know, kind of. You know, I don't want to call them busted preferred stocks, but just sort of um, maybe off the beaten path, one-off type situations. Um, so my, you know, I own 10 to 15 names and, you know, they, they each have to count the top 10 names are roughly 90% of the portfolio. I'm looking to underwrite 15 to 20% IRRs over a three to five year period. And so I manage money. It's on a separate account basis, um, uh, as well as I am a sub advisor to Ocean, Pro Ocean Cross Capital Partners, which is a Cayman Island hedge fund. And then I also uh, do a, a single idea special purpose vehicle. So uh, it, the highest conviction idea where maybe I have a limit in the fund, this would be something uh, where I'd look to invest as well. So, you know, as you would expect, uh, you know, all my net worth is tied up in this, you know, the same things that uh, I own uh, for, for, for clients. So that's sort of a quick overview of what I do. I'm, I'm just going to mention two other parts on, the, on a process point of view. Um, you know, this is sort of the research idea, you know, process. How do you find new ideas? And, you know, I, I think I do a lot of the same things others do. You know, I, I do my stock screens, uh, et cetera. I have a, um, I think I have a pretty good contact with, you know, people I respect, talk to a lot on the buy side. A lot of ideas come out uh, that way. 
Um, usually, you know, you might be looking at one idea and, you know, uh, you, know you, you look at that and that triggers in an idea for, for something else. So I, I think that comes about as well. I, I guess the overarching message I would say is that I love doing this. If I, if I wasn't running my own phone, I'd, I'd do this on the side anyway. And if the kind of search is an enjoyment process for you, I mean, there's sort of research ideas that show up uh, everywhere. And, um, and, and I, I think that that is really the heart of, you know, looking at, you know, being on the hunt for you know, new things. So um, I, you know, given uh, my background, I, I, I mean, I, these are the various steps you can sort of, you know, read through them. I know it's a lot of sort of text here, but, you know, the basic idea is, you know, you start with the company documents. Um, it, you you took a, take a look around, uh, you know, at the competitors. Um, I, I would consider myself a bit of a recovering uh, Excel aholic, if if that's such a word, you know, from you know background in investment banking. And it, I used to, you, you know, you make these huge models. They're probably only good, I admit, for two or three years and uh, into the future. But I think that that exercise is really helpful because it usually generates a lot of questions. And so even if the model itself maybe is not like you can very easily be precisely wrong. And you know, the idea of being directionally correct is really important. But I think going through all this work really helps you get more familiar. And I, I still employ that to um, a, a, a large extent. And you know, I have the freedom to invest across the capital structure. And you know, one thing, the, the, I guess the last thing I would highlight on just the overall research process would be step nine there on, on sort of uh, writing down your thesis. And I sort of, what I have adopted is I write an apology letter letter to myself uh, before I initiate a position, sort of looking three years out, uh, pretending three years in the future, the investment failed and I'm writing to myself why it failed. And I found this is a really good tool. Um, you, your mind plays tricks on you in some ways. It's very difficult to, you, you, the hindsight bias is so real and you sort of say, something is very obvious at this time, but it, it was not obvious, you know, a year or two ago, you know, you have the benefit of life happened and, you know, things you didn't anticipate happened. And I actually, as there are large parts of the investment process, I just, I blatantly stole this from, uh, I was on a panel with Bruce Greenwald from Columbia, a uh, fantastic Columbia professor. And uh, he mentioned this and he mentioned the context of uh, there were government officials uh, during the Vietnam War, during the Lyndon Johnson administration, who were shown memos that they had written and they looked at that 20 years later and they couldn't believe what they had actually written that. And it, it forces you to sort of stare it in the face as just as this is what you sort of said at that time. And so I, I really encourage others to do it. I think it's a real simple, but great little tool. So um, that's the background, pretty simple, I, I, I think. Um, I'm gonna sort of cover sort of three areas to sort of illustrate like how I think about names. Um, and uh, hopefully this provides some value into sort of how I look at investments. Um, you know, I mentioned owner operator a lot. I'm gonna talk about the Liberty Media Complex uh, a bit. Um, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the cable industry, which I, I spend a large portion of my time on. Um, there's some, um, I, I see the best opportunity in a couple of international priors that we're gonna talk about. And then, uh, you know, if you like contrarian investing, uh, you know, European financials or, you know, hey, that's the that, that's that's quite a place to go. You know, this is it, it's it's been a you know real challenging place. I'm going to talk about one in the context of, of, of Ireland. Uh, another idea that I was going to talk about, I, I, I can't talk about uh, uh, today. Uh, we're doing something else with that, but uh, I'll mention that as, as we get through. OK. So two cut sort of overriding themes, I think, uh, that I'm thinking about a, a bit, uh, neither one of which is going to be terribly new to anyone listening, is uh, growth has crushed value. And so I don't know if you can closely see these lines. You, you, you don't need charts to sort of see it. The, the, you know, the ones that are much higher, those are the growth ones. The ones that are lower, the value ones. You know, uh, the MSCI uh, indi indices are widely quoted. I just sort of show, you know, the value ones trading at half the valuation levels of the growth one. You can sort of get into the Q&A about like, you know, how much of this is justified versus not. But, you know, this is sort of a reality. I tend to find I'm on the value spectrum. I, 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 that's what I, I tend to own. I see a lot of cheap stuff in the context of a market that doesn't look terribly attractive to me. Um, and then the the U.S. has significantly outperformed the rest of the world. And, you know, one of the parts, you know, I am. Uh, I spend a lot of time outside the United States. Of my, of my, our funds 
current portfolio, we're roughly 60% outside the US and roughly 35% of that is in Latin America. And so um, you can sort of see if, you know, the US partially a function of, you know, more technology names here, partially a function of the dollar has been very strong versus international currencies. Um, it, it's left the rest of the world and it's it dust. And the only other thing I sort of mention in here is you, you hear a lot on like, you know, the MSCI emerging market uh, uh, fund or emerging markets in general. Um, most often emerging markets include China. And so if you, and even with China, they've significantly underperformed. If you were to X out China, then the degree of uh, underperformance is, is substantially more dramatic. And to the extent you have, uh, if you can wait towards um, international value, the international value has underperformed uh, e even more so. So just some observations. And I, so I, you know, I see more value on the value side and certainly uh, I see a lot of uh, more outside the United States. So, uh, you know, with that sort of overview, um, I, I'm talking about Liberty for a little bit. And I, as I mentioned, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska originally. So those first two roles are well known to me since, uh, you, you know, uh, growing up with them. Um, I added three and four, which aren't as uh, probably well known. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think I'll just make one sort of high level comment um, on, I, I think the Liberty family is much more similar to Berkshire than a lot of people appreciate. They are very long-term thinkers. I mean, 10 plus year uh, thinking in general. Um, I, would, I would say they're very tax efficient. The Liberty folks are a little more outspoken on it. But the, maybe the big difference is, you know, Berkshire is a conglomerate. They, you know, sort of say, you know, uh, they find value to combine it into one entity. And Liberty is probably more of an addition through subtraction. And they try to isolate discounts and, you know, spin off from there, et cetera. And, and th both have worked well uh, over time. And I think that, uh, you know, both can, you know, have created large amounts of value in the past. And I think there's, uh, you know, there's, a, there's quite a bit of opportunity on the Liberty side. So um, I have owned Liberty since I, uh, um, the early 2000s, sort of the when I first came across them. And, you know, I sort of say tongue in cheek, does, you know, does this look like it is going to be priced efficiently at all times? And the octagon shaped boxes are sort of tracking stocks. And the basic idea, it, it's not, it looks complicated. It's, it's relatively simple. It's, you have a business, maybe you, you, you own a couple different businesses, you want the market to place a value on it, maybe one is faster growing, uh, you know, perhaps you own, you know, a, a cable business along with other assets, you want to highlight that value, so you have an asset that tracks that initially, and uh, investors place value on each side of uh, e each side of the equation. And then ultimately, over time, these tracking stocks tend to become regular corporations. In you know, Liberty lingo, they're called asset-backed securities. It just means like normal corporation that's separate from others. And this pattern has repeated several times. And so when you sort of think about that basic logic, um, this seems very logical uh, to do. And you know, the great thing is you know, every you know, one or two years, I get a couple of new ideas to sort of look at that spin out of, of, of this complex. And um, they've created a lot of value uh, this way. Um, I would tell you that like, you know, if you're one of the just sort of, you know, interesting inefficiencies, I think in general, if you're a research analyst and you bring this to your PM, if you're, you know, if you're managing money for a, a separate account and you meet a client and you just sort of say, well, you know, I own, you know, I own Liberty Sirius, but I see three different stocks here. Well, yeah, we got a couple with the spin out. There's some A shares, there's some K shares. And and next thing you know, it's, you're going to have a lot of, you know, uh, glazed over eyes. And so um, I, this is where I've sort of, I've spent a lot of time here. Um, and, and I think that uh, there, there is a lot of value that has come out and still exists right now. So I'm going to run through uh, two quick examples of um, uh, one of the things that I think is interesting on the complex and in and, and buying um, charter communications and uh, Sirius XM, the, the, big, the second largest uh, cable company here in the United States, uh, as well as the uh, sort of ubiquitous satellite streaming company that you're probably very familiar with. 
Um, and both these assets are owned via uh, Liberty Broadband and Liberty Sirius. Liberty Broadband is an asset-backed uh, company that just recently merged with another asset-backed company, GCI Communications. Liberty Sirius is still a tracking stock that owns um, over 70% of Sirius. And so a little bit of a mouthful to get off. I'm, I'm, these are the asset values. And the point is, in the case of broadband, it's trading at nearly a 20% discount to its net asset value. In the case of Liberty Sirius, it's trading at nearly a 35% discount. And so if you take this to its logical extreme, you know, Charter and Sirius, I would sort of say more mature growth. They're still growing businesses, very defensible. We can sort of get into, I'm not going to address every specific with it. Um, but at, by buying these two companies via the Liberty entities, I think I'm buying at it, you know, on a look through basis, is a meaningful discount on two very cash generating assets. Um, and I think this is, this is really highly attractive for a way to buy two great businesses, uh, you know, trading at a discount. And, you know, on the next slide, I sort of put those two to sort of say, okay, look at these discounts and sort of speaking to what happens in the market today. Um, investors really don't want, you know, they, they're kind of shunning two just very obvious discounts that exist. And instead, what do they do? They're embracing a SPAC. So Liberty just, you know, joined the SPAC parade. They, it's attributed to um, a Formula One tracker. Um, and the SPAC has the asset value of $10. We don't know what they're going to buy. There's quite a bit of um, uh, competition in general for, for SPACs in general, uh, that Liberty has to probably in some ways compete with other assets and investors have bid this up to a 35% premium. Meanwhile, uh, in the case of, I'll just pick Liberty Sirius, there's very hard catalysts coming. Once they go there, they own 70% of the shares. Once they go above 80%, they can pay a dividend with no tax, negative tax consequences. And they are going to ultimately own probably the entire asset. They'll squeeze out the minority shareholders. And all this half, they're going to go above 80% likely sometime in calendar year 2021. Interestingly enough, the Liberty Worlds collided a bit with the whole GameStop, Melvin Capital short squeeze. Melvin was short serious. So there are people, professional investors out there who are long Liberty serious. They're short serious. Uh, Liberty serious was... Uh, um, there was a day this a couple of weeks ago where Sirius was up 15 percent and Liberty and Liberty Sirius was down seven. Now think about that. The the major the 70 some percent owner of Liberty Sirius was down seven or eight percent in a day that it's underlying the majority of the underlying asset was up 15. And it was just a question of once the squ short squeeze happened, you had to cover. And if you're covering, if you're an arbitrage investor, you're covering Liberty Sirius. Well, geez, then you know, you got to turn around and uh, you're probably selling off the Liberty Sirius. And so that sort of happened. And, um, you know, a little bit advantage of following this is I was scheduled to take my daughter to school and, you know, the, she came up and I said, well, we're going to be a tiny bit late. The shorts are getting squeezed and serious. And that somehow got translated back to, you know, mom, hey, hey, can you take me to school? Dad says somebody's squeezing somebody. And so sort of interesting, but it was, you know, it was, you know, the, the, the life at home of, uh, you know, working during a pandemic. I would sort of say one of the interesting things, I'm happy to address either Charter or Sirius in the, in the Q&A, is one of the challenges slash opportunities you have investing in this space is during periods of market turmoil, uh, the tracking stocks tend to sell off quite violently. And so in March of this year, you'd have, the other, you'd have situations again where you know, Sirius might be selling off four or 5%, Liberty Sirius would blow out 20, 25% lower. And so if you have discounts of 30%, they can go down to 40%. So you, you, know, you think about, you, we're gonna talk about leverage valuations here in a second, but you can get squeezed on, on both sides. But in my opinion, this creates uh, you know, a big opportunity. And it, you know, I've owned broadband for, for a long time now. Charter it has a great story probably not as cheap as it, uh, you know, it has been in the past, but this is still a larger discount, in my opinion, than, than should exist. Um, so now we're going to dive into cable. We mentioned Charter a bit. We're going to talk about two international cable names. And before we talk about that, I, you know, I think it's helpful to take a, you know, go back to 10,000 foot view of, you know, why is cable a good business? And generally, you know, you can read through the bullet points, but like, you know, we're talking about, it's an oligopoly type situation. There's only a couple competitors in general. Uh, that, that is a pretty good setup. Um, you have very predictable uh, 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 cash flow. This is an easier business to, to forecast, which is also, I think, highly appealing. You have recurring revenue. 
Um, very high barriers to entry. It almost looks like a natural monopoly in some cases. Once somebody's in place, the, the incremental IRRs for somebody overbuilding a cable property are not as strong. For a third player to over, overbuild, it becomes that much weaker. So you, once you go into a particular location, you change the return dynamics for uh, anybody else who's going to consider that going forward. And, it, you know, I, I mentioned that it, it kind of looks like a utility with pricing power. And, um, you know, that uh, introduces some, you know, <laughs> government risk even saying that, but that's sort of the, the idea. And, and so even, you know, I just noted here in the U.S., you had, probably, you know, Google would be about as close to a company with infinite resources as, it, you know, as exists, and they really struggle to penetrate the, you know, the U.S. cable market. I would say the second part of the cable story that I think is less well appreciated is that you have you are levered to one of the great secular uh, uh, growth stories, in my opinion, and namely that you're going to use a lot more data one year from now, three years from now, five years from now. And I show what I show here was just in the U.S. This is the the, the total dad, data consumption on a monthly basis, and it's year over year change. And obviously during a pandemic, um, you would expect those numbers to increase a lot, but uh, what, what's remarkable is, uh, you, you know, you, so when you're talking, you know, nearly 500 gigabits of data consumed in a month, uh, it, that, that would be a total that would have been considered the very highest end users just a couple of years ago. And now, in fact, it, it's 14 percent plus of users are using over a terabit of data per month. Uh, you know, a, over a thousand gigs. So I, and I would expect this to continue over time. And, uh, you know, one interesting part, a lot of people probably know is that, uh, you know, there, 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 there's something called Nielsen's law, which is it measures over its uh, not quite Moore's law in terms of the longevity, but the idea is for high end internet users, their connection speed to the internet has increased at nearly a 50% CAGR rate on an annual basis. And you can fit the line even to the last couple of years, this continues. Moore's law, you know, double the number of transmitters that you can fit every two years sort of implies something closer to 60% growth rate, but a 50% growth rate um, in, ter in, in terms of internet speed connections, I think is really powerful. And, you know, uh, it's the, the part following cable over time is I hear quite a bit, well, you know, what are you going to possibly need a one gig download speed, you know, internet modem for? And in my investment banking days, way back when, at the, in 2000, I was the analyst on a project. We were putting, uh, we were putting cable into the Mediterranean, and I was trying to forecast, you know, what broadband usage was going to be in Southern Europe and Northern Africa. And we were orders of magnitude off, you know, with the benefit of hindsight looking back. But there was a very well-known private equity shop at the time who passed on the deal. And their commentary was that we, there is no way anybody ever is going to need five megabits download speed. And, you know, so again, we're talking, you know, you know, a thousand meg here to get to one gig. And so the more things change, the more they stay the same. So, um, I feel pretty good about that side on the on the cable uh, story. And then I just sort of note, you know, a lot of these things, you, you pull up a cable name, and, well, geez, it's trading at 100 times earnings or, you know, trades at weird value. And there's really not a strong relationship between the depreciation schedule that flows through the cable business and um, the underlying maintenance capex. I mean, the, I think the joke uh, from, you know, the old uh, cable cowboy book was that, uh, you know, obviously, if you show losses, you minimize the tax burden. You also, this business can support leverage, and um, you, you might you show a very strong business, a strong free cash flow, but you might show gap operating losses. You know, the joke on Liberty was that if they ever showed a profit, that uh, John Malone was going to fire the accountant. So um, I, I thought what would be helpful as we talk about valuations is to you know again. I, to compare, cable property can support debt. It's re, as we sort of said. It's there's not a, there's just a couple of these firms as predictable recurring cash flow, and so you get a lot of EV EBITDA valuations, and it's a little abstract for some. So I thought it might be helpful just to compare cable, uh, a levered asset, to probably the leverage purchase that most uh, in, investors or just uh, most people in general are used to, and that's a house. And you know, it's not perfect. 
but generally speaking, the house is fairly stable, goes up a bit over time. Obviously, that was not the case here in the U.S. during the, you know, the great financial crisis, I know. But as a general rule, these things increase the low single digit over time. Uh, cable properties have similar type properties, actually. And you know, one other kind of corollary of what I just talked about was like, think about like if you're going to lay new cable properties and pick your metropolitan area around the world, Think about how it's going to be more expensive one, three, five, ten years from now to start digging up streets. I mean, just the environmental permits, et cetera. So, you know, here the idea is a lot of times if you're buying a house, you sort of say, well, geez, you know, what's the price per square footage? And I can come up with a housing value. And here would be a typical house purchase, right? A 20% down payment. Um, um, so that by definition, that means for the five parts or debt, and we wouldn't consider this irresponsible. And but you know, if we sort of say housing prices were going to rise or fall by 10%, if you have a 50% change in equity value, um, I highlight the cash flow yield down here because the, the principle again is not terribly different than cable. If, if if instead you sort of say, well, house, how much is it worth? Is it 225, 250 square foot? Well, I don't know, but if I can rent the house out for a thousand bucks a month. On my down payment, I can get a 24% free cash flow yield. And that probably is going to change the top line dynamics. And enough people sort of say, well, I'll take that bet, especially in a zero interest rate environment, and you probably move up the curve. Uh, I think a similar situation happens for cable companies in general. And what you can see up here, though, is what I point out, I still took a 10% change in a cable asset property, and probably a metric that a lot of people who you know follow cable are used to, well, six times versus 6.6 .6 versus 5.4 times. The cable companies uh, it leveraged it, uh, you know, sort of a, you know, if, uh, uh, if they're level, if if they're levered up, similar to, you know, 80% of it was debt, then you would sort of say that again, these small changes can cause large change in the equity value. Um, I'd say obviously the the point down here is the most critical one. So what's the big difference? You know, housing cable prices. Uh, you know, house. You, you don't really care if somebody gives you a low ball bid for your home uh, as a a public market investor, though, these things trade freely and I'm owning stuff outside the United States, the value is going to move all over the place, even for what I would consider a very stable asset. And so the very crux of you know, what I've seen over time is that even here in the US, if you took a 20 year picture of the cable industry, even though it's a pretty constant, like almost 45 ish degree line straight up in the in the change in EBITDA over time, the valuation investors have put on this has varied wildly. And within the Right now, currently, investors like the U.S. cable assets quite a bit. In the back of the presentation, in the appendix, I put the actual comps uh, for LATAM um, and for the U.S. cable guys so you can see it. But I thought it might be helpful just to follow the same framework. And, and I just took a, a cable company and we, we sort of said, well, hey, at, you know, say they have a little over $1.8 billion in EBITDA. And how would it be valued uh, at various parts around the world? And we're, we'll sort of say it, it can be leverage that's sort of four times. And these are the various changes in equity value, you know, pretty substantial here, uh, you know, 50% decline, 100% increase. And I think the basic point's the same, just like how if you got, if you can rent out a house for a certain amount of free cash flow, it's going to change the underlying dynamics. I think that happens ultimately with the LATAM cable names that we're talking about, is that they will have the higher free cash flow yield ultimately is going to change the underlying value. In addition, as we sort of say, there's a gigantic discrepancy between what private market investors pay for these assets versus public markets. Some of it is a function of the interest rate environment. There's large amounts of money that have flowed into infrastructure asset funds. And these funds, are not, they don't need to generate 20% IRRs that traditional private equity does. They, if they can get a low double digit levered uh, IRR. That means they can chase assets sort of almost mid single digit on an unlevered basis. And it makes uh, uh, terrestrial cable, subsea cable assets, cell phone towers, highly attractive. And these have been trading hands at 15 times EBITDA plus. And some of these same assets currently are valued uh, in, on the LATAM side at less than six times. So I the, the final point here is just on the, you know, on the us, you know, the sell side research, I gave a mock piece. And with when you have this dynamic, if you have leverage on an entity, you can make the valuation say whatever you want. You, if you're bullish, you can tweak up the EBITDA, EV EBITDA multiple. If you're bearish, you can tweak it down. And I, what I have found is that the, a lot of the sell side community will value it around where the current comps are, and then they'll just jack up the prices when the comps move. And I think you kind of have to be there first.
products. And sort of, you know, if the SOC is at $24 and they've increased the, you know, the price target from 12 to 24, probably a little less help for you, you know, right then. And so hopefully the idea is we're going to where the, the puck is going to over time. So the two I'm going to highlight and, uh, you know, each one would probably be, you know, a multi-hour discussion uh, that uh, would put several to sleep. Some might find it fascinating. I'm going to summarize relatively quickly. Liberty Latin America came out of Liberty Global. It owned two cable assets, uh, one in Puerto Rico, one in Chile. And the idea was they were going to take advantage of a fragmented cable market. Cable's a scale business. The more subscribers you have, the more you can... Uh, sort of put your fixed costs against a larger subscription base and have an advantage over your competitors. From the time that this was, this initially came out at uh, between $40 and $50 a share, the, the target prices on the name were probably between $70 and $80. Um, the, uh, Liberty Latin America was a tracking stock, became an asset backed security, and they went out of the gate early on, did a deal to buy cable and wireless. Uh, they paid um, a, a big multiple for it. The deal did not work as well. Um, and then they had a big hurricane hit Puerto Rico. And so stock went from 40 to 20 and then COVID hit. Uh, so, you know, you, you've been, you know, almost sucker punched a couple different times uh, with, with the name. Um, and uh, I, it, the, the current management team that I'm going to flip forward here, just talking about, you can read about where the opportunity exists. So from COVID, you know, the stock went from sort of 20-ish from the initial uh, hit down to, you know, not far from, you know, the, you know, 11-ish dollar uh, range that trades right now. And so uh, they, you had cable and wireless, it didn't work out well, but you had a, a new management team who came in who was not involved in the cable and wireless deal, um, who've made substantial operational changes in the business, um, uh, operational improvements. They've done several deals that I think are attractive. And it's just before you needed them to execute you know, perfectly and roll up a lot of LATAM, you know, very successfully. Now, it's just not hard to get to a $20 plus price target, assuming nothing else happens. And this is a team that they're going to want to do a lot more deals. And should be pointed out, you know, pre the hurricane, uh, 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 pre Hurricane Maria, John Malone had purchased nearly $40 million in the open market at prices uh, at, you know, $20, $25 uh, per share, you know, stock trades, 11 to $12 currently. So I'm just going to briefly mention, you know, I, I sort of, you can read the various deals. The one to highlight is uh, AT&T. They, they, they bought AT&T's wireless assets in Puerto Rico. Um, Interestingly, you know, Hurricane Maria in some ways was a test case in just how resilient cable is. I mean, overnight you had the entire island went dark. And so essentially your revenue went to zero. Uh, and this has all come back and then some. Uh, Puerto Rico is their strongest market right now, uh, been doing incredibly well. Um, and, you know, it's them, one other competitor who has a copper footprint. Um, they, they have a faster connection, taking a lot of market share, and now they have a wireless asset that was purchased from AT&T. Lilac was the only strategic bidder. And part of this is, you know, classic, you know, Liberty thinking is they purchased the asset, they used AT&T's uh, cash flow, uh, levered it four times to, to help pay for the purchase. And you know, one technical point I would make is they did this as an all cash deal. If you had sort of said they, if they used four times AT&T Puerto Rico's cash flow and think about the difference between the roughly 1.3 billion in levered up free cash flow and the 1.9 billion dollar purchase price is sort of the quote unquote equity plug. You, you end up getting with the synergies that exist that are, I think are going to be over 80 million dollars. Um, you get IRRs north of 30%. And to deploy $1.9 billion in this interest rate environment with that type of return profile, I think is incredibly powerful. So um, you know, in summary, it, it's just the stocks bombed out. The free cash flow, it, it, the, the name is lightly covered, I would sort of say. It's split between the, the uh, LATAM sell side community who just, they just can't understand how a cable company could operate at four and a half times of uh, leverage in, in their world, not used to it. Some U.S. guys cover it. It's not the greatest coverage. They don't have confidence in their you know, tax estimates. 
Um, a lot of the, the AT&T deal has just closed. They had done another acquisition of Telefonica's properties in Costa Rica. That is not incorporated into forward estimates. And the AT&T deal is not fully into it. And so all you need is these two deals plus synergies, plus some obvious margin improvement at cable and wireless, and you get a huge number on a free cash flow. And sort of the interesting part of it is, is when does, if I'm right on the name re-rates on an EV EBITDA basis, obviously it's dramatic for the equity. But what's interesting is that it could re-rate after this cash flow comes in and either they repurchase shares or they buy other cable assets. And then in addition, they own substantial number of cell phone towers, terrestrial cable, subsea assets. So you just sort of look at it and it, it's going to be bumpy. There's going to be all sorts of headlines. Yes, LATAM was hit hard by COVID. It'll be slower to, to come back. Undoubtedly true. But it, you, it's one of these situations. I just think that you need very little to go right and you can have a tremendous upside. So the other one I'm just going to briefly highlight is Mega Cabla, which is the second largest cable company in Mexico. Again, family controlled business. Um, you know, what's, what's interesting too on the names I'm talking about is that, you know, these are smaller market cap names, but the actual freely traded float is, is, is even smaller when you incorporate um, the family ownership or insider ownerships in the names. Um, the, the, there's there's uh, Televisa is the largest uh, cable standalone cable company. The largest telecom company is probably one uh, most people or a lot of people would know American Mobile, Carlos Slim controlled entity. And uh, Mexico is really just a, a, a fabulous little cable market. And um, I, this slide here gives some scope of the opportunity. And this touches on a little bit of the lilac theme as well. As, you know, as I mentioned, U.S. investors love the the U.S. cable industry, and they love the just the reliability of you know we've had broadband games, the pandemics probably pulled forward, you know some of this demand, um, and they've grown very well for larger companies the last you know three to five years. But longer term, the bigger growth is likely going to come from overseas, and it's just a simple fact that broadband penetration levels are substantially uh, you know lower in this part of the world. And so a lot of folks, you're probably familiar with, you know, the triple play of cable, you know, your broadband, your video and your telephone connection for those who still have a landline. There's sort of a triple play growth opportunity for international names. And, you know, the first part's just it, there's going to be a, you know, as as countries grow wealthier over time, they uh, the, the number of broadband uh, connections increases and pretty proportionately as well. And so I think that continues. So the entire pie increases as, you know, Mexico moves a bit to the left here, as some of the Latin American countries move to the left. This is quoted on a percent per 100 inhabitants. If you want to just think about it in terms of the population, the U.S. is roughly, you know, uh, just under 90 percent penetrated on a broadband basis. You know, various markets in LATAM, they're half that level. So it, the, the entire pie expands that way. You also have an opportunity for additional rollouts of where you connect with your existing plant of cable and you connect into additional towns. And so you expand the number of homes passed. And then the final part is you increase the penetration level. And so the cable investor would typically look at a broadband connection and, and, and compare that connection as a percent of total homes passed. And so if the broadband pie is expi expanding, you're increasing the number of connections, and then you'd have connection rates that rise from 35 that, you know, they could go up, you know, 10 percentage points. They're over 50 percent in some parts of the United States right now. I think it's an incredibly powerful growth story. So why does mega cable trade cheap. A lot of it is, is country specific risk that the economy was slowing to begin with. You had concerns on um, you know, the president, a, a populist president with a leftist uh, bent um, in AMLO. And I, I think a combination of, hey, GDP was weakening, they were hit hard by COVID and we have AMLO and it just, they're going to, the whole country's out of favor. Even a name that is incredibly resilient. And if you have to own something in emerging markets, I think cable assets are among the best things to you know, possibly own. And so here, this is the macro concerns that explain the stock weakness. And there's a lot of charts, a lot of numbers on the chart. I would just sort of say for the sake of time, it's an asset that's been able to grow its operating cash flow consistently at a, a, a double digit rate. It also, it's 80% cable, like a lot of cable companies, it's roughly 
20% has a corporate business providing internet to businesses, among other IT services. That part of the business, that 20% is likely going to grow at a 15% CAGR. Cable business probably goes at a, a 10% CAGR over time. Um, and so this particular name, it's if you sort of said at the beginning of the year, you know, hey, Mexico's economy is weak going in. It's going to be in full-blown recession. It's going to be hit hard by COVID. You have a populist president who's going to be making, you know, certain business unfriendly uh, rhetoric. It hasn't affected the, the, the telecom industry. What was their operating performance in the first nine months of this year? They increased revenue 4%, no CF 7%. So you have a name that trades that under six times EBITDA, right, well-regarded family. I think they're going to generate over $8, uh, eight, eight, uh, sorry, eight pesos per share uh, in free cash flow by 2024. Stock trades in the high 70s. And oh, by the way, it is completely unlevered. It's very liber unliberty like to, to do this. And as a shareholder, I'm, uh, yeah, I can't believe, you know, you could, like, you could today go out, levered up three times, pay a special dividend. You could increase the stock 30, 40% overnight if you wanted to. I think ultimately they sell out. Um, and as I provided a, 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 uh, you know, something in the appendix, it's it's probably a, a merger with uh, uh, Televisa's cable operations would unlock a lot of synergy values. Um, and I, I, I think there is a day that, uh, you know, their outside investors, including Lilac, could be very interested in this property. But at this level, with no debt, with this starting valuation, you just sort of say it's really difficult to lose here. Now, this one trades, you know, the other thing they could do, you know, to be honest, is they could just have an ADR trade in the United States. When I tell people about Mega Cabla, a lot of thing, a lot of times they just sort of say, well, I can't buy stuff directly in Mexico. I can't own stuff in Mexico. And I think that alone is 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 one of the big discounts. Um, so you know, the cable risks, I'll sort of say for the big one, it, it, it's regulation change. You know, if you're talking about a utility with uh, you know, freedom to price. It, 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 by definition, you know, you, you probably have to be worried about regulation and then you have new technology. Um, interestingly on cable, if I gave a presentation on Comcast 20 years ago, the top two risk factors would have been the exact same. I mean, this is just sort of a constant go forward. And if you throw in the international side, certainly there's, there's currency risks, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, mega cobblers, pesos. Um, in Lilac, you'd have to worry about the the Chilean peso. The Caribbean generally is pegged to the dollar less so, but you know it can happen. In the case of Lilac, you know they could do another bad deal. That's that's a risk. But I I think obviously you're more than compensated. So I'm 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 going to cover the last part really really quickly. Um, just switching gears on you know financials. As I sort of said, if you like contrarian uh, investing, this is sort of the bucket you should probably spend some time looking at. And you know here you know I, even with a rally at the end of the year. You know, at the end of January, the MSCI European financials were trading at 75% tangible book value. Obviously, a, like close to a zero interest rate environment has been a real problem, um, and probably an overbank sector has been a, has been an issue. Um, and so, I, I I think just when you've had declines like this, just you've had everybody throw in the towel. This is sort of an interesting place to look, and financials can be broadly defined. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about Kennedy Wilson. Kennedy Wilson does things outside of Europe. I'm just going to speak specifically to what they do in Ireland. I was, as I said, I was going to speak on a, a another name. If you know, you sort of hear what I say on Ireland. And you're interested in your qualified investor. Uh, give me a call. I think there's a, an interesting um, you know, other opportunity in Ireland as well. Um, so with Kennedy Wilson, this is a it's a um, it, it, it's it's an owner operator real estate company. They're a global company. They, um, they, they, the insiders own 24% of the shares. Uh, they've had a fantastic track record of uh, going into markets after they've blown up. They invested in Japan uh, post the carnage of the late 80s, went in there in the 90s. They went in the US during the global financial crisis. Then they went into Ireland, uh, sort of post the financial crisis in Ireland, which I'm going to talk about. They do multifamily and commercial. I'm happy to answer in the Q&A if you want to get into it. They are they they do suburban versus urban, um, and they're in markets with very favorable uh, housing dynamics. And for those of you from California who happen to be listening to this, you know they're probably they might be the largest uh, multifamily owner in Boise, Idaho, where a lot of people from California are moving towards. And so one of the inefficiencies when you talk about real estate is generally covered from the focus of people who own things in San Francisco, uh, in New York, in Boston, some of the larger cities, and that's not where they are. Um, I think if anything, the business is going to be, they're going to come out of COVID um, uh, quite stronger. 
what I want to just mention just real briefly in the, in the couple minutes I have left was what they did in Ireland. So they, along with uh, Prem Wasta at Fairfax, and Fairfax remains a very large shareholder in Kennedy Wilson, they recapitalized the, the, they helped recapitalize the Bank of Ireland. And they bought, in Kennedy Wilson's case, they bought the commercial portfolio. And this commercial portfolio became Kennedy Wilson Europe, uh, which was later merged into Kennedy Wilson. And so via this portfolio and the Kennedy Wilson team is down in LA, I've had a chance to go down there, spend a lot of time with them and learn a lot about the I Ireland opportunity. And you know, quite simply, I Ireland was, was, was hit really hard by the financial crisis. The, the government had to nationalize, essentially nationalize the banking sector, guarantee all liabilities. They had a huge run up. The market tanked. It's just been an absolute tear the last seven years. And the other part of Ireland, probably known as sort of a tax haven, people go here for the low tax rates. But the phenomenon that's happened in Ireland is a lot of tech companies may have come for the tax rate initially, but they stayed for the engineers. There's a fantastic education system in Ireland, steady supply of engineers every single year. And tech companies generally tend to like to be in sort of, uh, you know, clusters with it, with, with each other. And that's what led to the other opportunity that I, I, unfortunately I cannot talk about right now, that is like, what else is going on in Ireland? And so this is just a quick picture of um, office properties of Kennedy Wilson uh, in Dublin itself. You, you, you know, you see several tech names on here. I'd note even the financial service names, the JP Morgan, large number of those tenants are actually technology workers working for a large bank. Um, this is the this is the largest multifamily community in Ireland when it's complete. They've gone through a couple phases. It's going to be 865 units total. This is part of what they developed over time. It's sort of the secret sauce of Kennedy Wilson is they 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 buy something with the opportunity to phase on you know ad additional uh, parts to the story, and it's just a, a fabulous uh, housing real estate story in general in Ireland. And um, Kennedy Wilson participates, you know, via uh, the multifamily units. There's 300,000, you know, um, uh, rental units. It's less than 5% institutionally owned. The much higher ownership rates in the rest of Europe. There's a, you know, a lot higher apartment ownership rates. I think this is, a, you know, when you combine favorable demographics, big tech center, and then what I'm going to show next, I, in terms of the housing prices, I think this is a real, real interesting country. And I think regardless of what happens um, uh, on interest rates in general, and um, I, I, I should probably make a, you know, a tongue in cheek comment a little bit, you know, for European financials in general, if, if you knew rates were going to rise, you could just take a dartboard and put a bunch of banks on, a, you know, a dartboard and throw some darts because you probably make pretty good money from starting valuations. I think the ones that I see more attractive, well, you know, it, it the interest rate side would just be, you know, sort of a feather in the cap for other parts of the story. So here's the housing, uh, uh, you know, chart of, of residential housing prices. Um, I think it's likely you're going to top 2007 levels within the next couple of years. If you're providing finance to uh, the real estate market in general in Ireland, I think it's highly attractive. And a large portion is this chart is they have in Ireland, you need 30,000 units constructed on an annual basis in order to just keep up with demand. And you're running at sort of you're running at anywhere from a 10 to 20,000 unit in the hole. And that was pre COVID and COVID probably slowed down some of the housing construction. And it's a real issue in Ireland right now, just in terms of you know, one of the big political issues is the affordability of housing in general. And this dynamic lasts for some time. And in fact, the the, the number of students is so high, they're going to run out of housing for students alone in four years, it, not counting the rest of the population unless this uh, balance is flipped. And obviously that's gonna take some time, which I think creates some opportunity. And so these, uh, I apologize, probably a little blurry. It's essentially showing Ireland uh, handled the pandemic. It wasn't perfect, but better than a lot of other countries. It grew faster during 2020, probably comes out of this growing faster than most of the developed uh, countries as well. And so, you know, outside of China, this is probably an area, you know, probably a little closer to the United States, maybe easier for some of the U.S. to get their arms around, I think has a fantastic, you know, runway. So um, I ran a, maybe a little hot on time, but, um, you know, here's my contact information. Why don't I pause there and Graham will go ahead and jump into the questions. All righty.
Thank you so much for that presentation, Patrick. It does look like we have a good couple of questions here lined up, so we can go ahead and jump into those now. Uh, first of which being, uh, how do you feel about the growth of streaming alternatives such as Netflix, Disney+, Plus, kind of all of those, in regards to your predisposition to cable? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question, and I think this is the part that cable investors have gotten uh, more comfortable on. <clears throat> and it's just it, the the easiest way to answer it is that the the broadband subscriber, it, you, you, you know, cable metrics are you know you if you have a couple services, you pay one price, and they can allocate the revenue and costs however they want to. But the underlying gross margins of the cable business are typically above ninety percent. The the Video gross margins of cable business are, you know, they were sort of 40%, and then they've been going down materially every single year. The cable costs per sub in general have been increasing at close to a 10% rate over time. And one of the big sea changes in cable, and we're, and I'm answering this first from a U.S. Uh, 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 perception, because I think that's where the question's geared towards, is that uh, cable companies have just sort of, they're, they're not going to chase unprofitable video subs. And so one of the interesting parts of that dynamic is that as you add more broadband subs to your mix, all else equal, you become a more profitable business. And it doesn't stop just there. The largest source of CapEx dollars for the cable industry is the customer premise equipment. The, it, generally, the, 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 the TV set top boxes topping the list of things that go into your home. To the extent you become a broadband only subscriber, he goes, I can cut down, if I'm a cable company, I can cut down on the amount of CapEx that comes in uh, to the individual home. On top of that, you know, so, you know, door number three is simply that if you have a video product, you're far more likely to call in and sort of say, there's a problem with the video product, I need something uh, fixed. And so you spend a lot more time on customer uh, uh, retention, customer service costs, for a video sub than you would for a broadband. And so I think one of the parts of the cable story that has become much better appreciated is that it turns out that as you move towards more of a broadband focused um, cable customer, you're not only more profitable, you can generate a, a higher amount of free cash flow. And that probably wasn't as intuitively obvious as it was five years ago. And I think the other add-on opportunity is you can become, as the more, the more things change, you know, you kind of revert back to where you were initially. With all these streaming services, there's probably an opportunity for the cable folks to be the aggregator of aggregators. And so you can put in, you know, whatever you want, your next, your Netflix, your Disney, um, your Discovery Plus, you know, if, if, if that's you're interested into one picture on your TV, you can swap back and forth between that. Outside the United States, the dynamic, it, it could end up repeating. You don't have the same dynamic because your costs per month are not as high. And it's just simply because, generally speaking, internationally, you pay for sports on an a la carte basis versus here, you have the ESPN boogeyman running around demanding, you know, eight bucks plus per month, whether or not you watch college football or not. So I think the, in the U.S., the investors have probably gotten more uh, comfortable in that dynamic outside the U.S., um, less clear exactly how th this will this will play out o over time, given significantly low, lower video ARPUs. Gotcha. That's a great question. For sure. And next question on our list, uh, just bumping down here. Do you use an equity grid on John Malone's empire like Mario Gabelli does? Yeah, I, I do it slightly different than, uh, you know, than, than Mario as well. I, I have sort of, a, you know, as I sort of said, I've owned most of them. I, I sort of, I see, you know, I, 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 I frame it more in sort of upside downside type scenarios on what I see is, you know, you know, um, logical outcomes in terms of, you know, cash flow that I can project uh, over time. I also... You know, I probably don't have any limits. I, I can hold larger exposures on some of the, you know, on 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 some of the international names. And so, I think that um, I I would probably put a bigger priority in terms of my upside downside case analysis versus I would in you know certainty of outcome perhaps. Uh, and there's it's not to say that it, you know a another way is you know can't be used or can't be used very well. That's how I do it. Gotcha. 
in continuing on, um, do you have any thoughts or an opinion on Unity Group? No, I on on the, the Unity Media Group or on Unity alone. Um, we'll have to wait. Strong, yeah, why don't we go to the next? I don't have strong thoughts, so definitely. And um, how much macro analysis goes into your research, especially when evaluating companies outside of the U.S.? Yeah, it's a, it's a really fair question, and it's a good one. And um, I, think, um, I think a lot of times where you ultimately come to, where the hardest part of it is, is what is the intrinsic value of the Brazilian real or a Chilean peso or a Mexican peso? And this one is, 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 is very difficult. And you know, the folks who sort of do that on a regular basis, the, uh, the track records aren't necessarily fantastic. Clearly, we've been in a multi-year period where the dollar has been a lot stronger. And um, can that continue? You, you know, dollar has weakened here of, of late for sure, but you know, are we going to revert, et cetera? You have multiple different opinions. And I think, um, I think that uh, I, I, I would sort of tell you that one, uh, amazingly, one of the best indicators I have seen is the economist, the, the Big Mac index is sort of when you simplify everything else to sort of like, what's a hamburger cost you around the world? And it is directionally on a short term basis. It's awful. It doesn't tell you anything. You know, it could, you know, the currency can move up or down from that over longer stretches of time. You know, the basic purchasing parity, purchasing power parity theory is all this is, I think, generally holds. And in a lot of the, you know, currencies that I invest in, uh, you know, the, the dollar looks really expensive against a lot of these. And, you know, um, I, 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 you know, I, I see the same thing everyone does, you know, we, we're running big deficits um, uh, over time. There's a debate about will that matter at all, you know, now in the future, you know, interestingly enough, the LATAM, a lot of them were hit harder, it depends on the country, by uh, the COVID crisis, they just physically, they, they could not invest as much money as the US on a, on a percentage basis. And so ultimately over time, is that gonna help or hurt? You know, Mexico was criticized heavily because they did have room, you know, if you look on a debt to GDP basis, certainly to invest in stronger fiscal measures than they did. But will ultimately, will that make a stronger peso over time? You know, somewhat debatable, um, but I sort of look at that, the, the part I would emphasize is what you, most times, most train wrecks for emerging market investors it's some combination of, you know, hey, I borrowed in dollars and my functional currency is the, the local currency. And one of the advantages of investing alongside with Liberty is like that, that doesn't happen. If you're going to borrow in dollars, you're going to swap it into the local currency. They're not going to take the FX risk on the actual debt side. You might have translation risk, but you're not going to have that. And also they're going to, you know, try to fix in interest rates. So that's sort of a, a comfort area that uh, that I have over time. But, you know, I, I am not invested in uh, Argentina um, and, you know, uh, uh, you know a, a company that has defaulted that many times. So that's a challenge. And I would sort of say the other advantage here, I own, you know, Mega Cabla, Mexico, sort of a unique trading partner with the United States, proximity to the U.S., I think it's a little easier. If I have to invest in a lot of other parts, I'm comfortable. I'd like to have a little bit more geographic diversity in case there's a problem with one market. I'm not as, you know, directly as exposed if I own something, you know, directly in Bolivia. Understood. And moving down our list now, uh, looking on or at market valuations at this point in time, uh, do you share the view that we're in a, a bubble that some may say are of epic proportions at this point in time? Yeah, a uh, little bit of a loaded question, maybe, but it's a, you know, it's a fair one. And it, I would say this is that I, I understand the um, you know, some of these, the, the, the largest names that dominate the S&P 500, these are, are undoubtedly some of the best businesses that have ever been created. And um, they're very valuable, generate, they have good growth rate. There's a lot of good news priced into that, though, as well. I can't totally get there. It's not my area of expertise. And, and, and so, you know, that's, I don't think I'm going to add a lot of value on that debate. I see the same thing on, you know, certain, you know, video conference companies that compete with one of these tech goliaths that trade at 50 times forward revenue. I don't know how the DCF works on that. And so it seems like pockets that it's it's really, really hard. 
And I just, but I, I try not to, I'm not out there trying to short those or trying to, you know, guess exactly how that breaks. But what I can observe though, is I, I see the same thing, I think behind the, the premise of the question, but then I sort of look around and I see very stable businesses, in my opinion, that there is, you know, some macro concerns that you have to come, you know, uh, you come to grips with that we, we just talked a, a bit about, but have multi-year opportunities in trade at just very, very, you know, pedestrian levels of free cash flow and clearly below uh, any type of private market value. And so it's sort of an interesting situation because, you know, if the whole market blows up. Some of these names, they're undoubtedly, they're, they, they, they will take some hits. But, you know, some of the rotation that, you know, started in November, does it continue? I don't know for sure. But I do know that of the, the ones that I mentioned, I think they have teams that they own a lot of stock themselves. They're motivated to get it higher. And ultimately, you know, my bet is they're going to figure out how to do it. And if I start at this valuation level, I, I think the odds of success are high. Definitely. Continuing down our list, uh, regarding Mexican broadband, do you model in share losses to Viasat and or Starlink? And do you consider either to be competitive threats? No, I, I, th it's an interesting question. It's a really good question. I would sort of, I would say total play would be the other, you know, kind of fiber overbuilder at times that I'd probably be more worried about than those two. Um, I cut the discussion a little short on Mega Cobble for, for just time, but generally their strategy would probably be considered something closer to, uh, for those familiar with Charter here in the United States, it'd be more of a volume strategy versus an ARPU driven strategy. And so on the ARPU side, generally in most markets where they exist, they are the low cost uh, provider, which provides quite a bit of comfort. And in Mexico, you know, you're talking, you know, we're talking like 50 meg, you know, download, you know, the joke was like, you know, they can offer it depending on the area they are is that, you know, we talk to the management team of gigantic bell rings every time somebody buys like sort of a, you know, 100 meg plus uh, uh, download product. One interesting thing to sort of talk about the, if you buy into my, you know, the thesis about like, you know, you're going to use a lot more data over time is that, um, they are actually overbuilding a fiber overbuild over their um, uh, hybrid coaxial cable in 50% of their footprint. And it's a network investment. It hurts their free cash flow short term, but it obviously allows them to provide a symmetrical uh, uh, broadband offering over time. And ultimately, you know, a path of one gig symmetrical, you know, plus, and, you know, ultimately, you know, someday it'd be, you know, uh, 10 gig symmetrical. But they overbuilt on 50% of their footprint. And it's sort of interesting that they did it is, is that most cable analysis, with the, there's a bit of a debate about whether that is a fantastic analysis versus following something called the DOCSIS 3.1 uh, framework, where you try to get more speed out of the existing hybrid network that you have. They did this overbuild as a forward thinking sort of saying, this is like orders of magnitude beyond what they need. But in Mexico, because labor is so cheap, what they're able to do with that hybrid, with the fiber investment is they can recycle, you know, some of the cables that are in the existing plant, as well as the uh, CPE equipment in the other 50% that doesn't have the fiber overbuilt. And so when you talk about any, you know, uh, some sort of uh, a competitive broadband threat, it's gonna have to be competitive to a low cost operator with in their largest areas that has a full blown fiber footprint. And I think that's going to be, uh, I, I think that will be a challenge for some. And you know, on top of that, I, Mexico in particular, you have these wonderful opportunities where you can edge out from your existing plant. It's called a brownfield project. And you're generating a gigantic, you know, I estimate from Mega Cabla when they edge out from their existing plant, those are 30% incremental IRR. So as we talked about, as soon as they go in, they change the IRR profile immediately for somebody else. Because if you're going to overbuild, your two assumptions that you have to get right are, what is my penetration rate going to be? And what is my customer churn going to be? And then if somebody goes in first, lower cost operator, I think it's challenging. I feel pretty good about their competitive position. Definitely. And... Do you have any view on Liberty Global in Europe? Yes, I, I, I own it. Um, this is another one that I, I would sort of, I, I would try to answer this without like, you know, I, I, I'm teased for being long-winded on questions. I, I think the basic 
deal when you separate out Liberty Global, what they what they have right now, they've probably disappointed investors from a growth side over the last five years. Those you they're more mature markets uh, in general, and people have doubts about the uh, you know the trajectory of the UK business. But with the merger in Switzerland, which was you know one of their two problem markets in Europe, with when they purchased Sunrise, when you fast forward that merger plus this the the Telefonica O2 combination with Virgin Media in the UK, you, you're going to get a, a an enormous uh, a free cash flow stream that generates over time, and you, you could be looking at sort of. Uh, you know, uh, an asset right now that ultimately generates close to two and a half billion dollars of free cash flow. And it's hidden a bit because you can't see the synergies coming through from these two deals, as well as um, uh, the so so you get the benefit from those deals coming through uh, expanded operations as well. And they're also going around rolling out new fiber throughout uh, uh, the UK to increase the number of households. And I think that um, if you X that out, it's far, far cheaper than it's realized on a free cash flow basis. And I think the story has been people have been burned. Part of it is just with all of this. It's just like you, you say these things and people sort of say like, you know, hey, OK, I get you. Lilac's cheap. Global's cheap. And, you know, I don't want to look through 35 different spreadsheets. I'm just going to go buy charter. That seems to always go up. And, you know, it's, <laughs> it's that maybe not technology, but like I think that's sort of the thing that you're fighting. And one of the ironic things is that. If the U.S. cable guys break, that could be one of the "quote unquote" catalysts that actually causes people to look at the international names. But you know, ultimately, I think they'll get it right. Um, and it, one last point on global would be that unlike the U.S., these are quad play markets. So you have um, in the U.S., you know, Verizon, AT&T, they only have fixed footprints over portions of the United States. In Europe, the incumbent telecom provider generally has a fixed and mobile presence over the entire country. And so that's why it's a harder market in general. But one of the things that they, you've had a lot of success in is when you combine the, you know, the triple play offering with the mobile offering. And that's what they're trying to do in each of these markets. Either they be a national champion quad play player or they sell out and like they did in Germany. And I, I think ultimately that will produce, a, it won't be a fast growing uh, business, but it will produce a, a significant amount of free cash flow over time. Understood. And we'll go, we'll call it this second to last question before we get to our, our final one here. Um, any thoughts on any of the content providers like Discovery, Lionsgate, AMC Networks, things like that? They've had quite a run. Um, you know, I, in past letters, um, you know, I, 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 I still own Discovery. I have been selling that to finance you know, some of the other names, you know, that, that we, we've talked about. And, uh, you know, you had names that I was, you know, bemoaning the fact that you had um, you 20% free cash flow yields, but the company could issue 30 year bonds at like, you know, sub 5% and people were bidding up the, the 30 year paper to, uh, you know, 120%. I, I didn't understand any of it. And, you know, so now you've, you've had this huge run and you sort of look around and, you know, they're, it, it, the jury's still out. Can they make a transition? The stocks were so cheap that, you know, now they're probably, they, they, they reflect, um, you know, certainly the multiples are higher, but, uh, you know, they're still, you know, a decent clip below the broader market on, you know, on a, on a free cash flow uh, basis. But, you know, they're not as cheap and you're probably dependent at, at current prices a lot more to their streaming products working. And what is the market for that? For I don't own, you know, I haven't, I think Discovery was the only content one I had owned. And um, I think in general, though, you'd have to say it is a more challenging you know, space for sure. I mean, it's just you don't own your uh, own destiny quite as as nicely. And, and you know, on the content side, especially, that is, there's no doubt scale business, you know, you can spend more, etc. So if you're a general entertainment uh, subscale content company, I think that's going to be really, really hard to compete versus uh, you know, Netflix, Disney over time. If you do something a little different, well, I think you have a chance. But the whole sector harder. If you're general entertainment, I think too hard. Definitely. And last one to, to go ahead and round things out from uh, Larson Rice out in the, the audience there. Um, 
would you have any pieces of advice for for young value investors looking to go out and develop their own style and process and instead of simply trying to to copy some of the big name investors out there yeah i i i i think so i i would i'll give you um two pieces of, of advice on this i would just sort of say i'll give you three is obviously the one you've heard from everyone just read all the time you know do um it, like read everything you can uh as much as you can follow what interests you i think that's really helpful i think doing something of a mock portfolio is really really helpful as well and save the results of those like you know what you bought x number of shares of this create your own portfolio it's wonderful and you don't have clients looking over your shoulder about like what you did how your you know performance was write down and and then keep uh, written records of everything you do why did um you know i bought you know xyz um and this is why i'm buying it and this is what happened and then go back a year from now and and reevaluate what you wrote down why you did it and 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 write any thoughts for it and try to keep records of all of that over time and if you start you know, if you're starting early, you know, around the time you're in college and you kept that going for 20 years, I think that exercise alone would make you uh, a, a far, far stronger uh, investor. And I think you'll I, I, I think you would force yourself to learn from sort of your own mistakes and you'll have the written word to get, kind of go back on. And um, it's just hard to do it. You know, it's just sort of like, you know, you it, like maintaining the discipline to do that is, is really, really challenging with everything that's going on. But I think if you could stick to those couple of things, I, I really think that would help you. And I really wish I would have done that, you know, from, you know, I started doing it later, better late than never. But I think I would have been a far better investor had I started from that from day one. Absolutely. Well, Patrick, it's been an absolute pleasure today. Thank you so much for, for coming on and giving us a, a great presentation and taking the time to answer the questions from our audience. Uh, like I said, you know, we're all we're all very happy to have had you here today. It, it's It's been a, a great time sitting here. Great. Thanks again for the opportunity to present, and please reach out to me if you have any follow-up questions. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. And for all of you out in the audience, there will be a full recorded version of this available here on YouTube as well as on GuruFocus.com. If you want to swing back, check out those slides, anything like that. Uh, we will have uh, Patrick's contact information down in the description as well uh, if you want to get that there. Uh, and for everybody out there, if you are in the U.S., we hope you're, you're staying warm in the middle of this deep freeze, and we hope everybody can stay safe and stay healthy out there. So from Guru Focus, we wish you all a good one.